what do this sea turtle, this rhino, and this pelican all have in common? Stick around and you'll find out. I'm Julie Scardina, and this is Nikki and Nellie, two rescued dogs, one from Nashville and one from Hurricane Katrina. And they both have found loving adoptive homes in Florida. You know, when we think of rescued animals, we often think of domesticated animals, like dogs and cats. But wild animals need our help, too. Whether searching for food, fending off predators, defending their territory, battling viruses and diseases, or simply enduring weather, daily life can be a challenge. And then you throw in human impacts like pollution and habitat destruction, and it can go from challenging to life-threatening. Thankfully, though, there are dedicated individuals, organizations, and companies which are committed to helping save wildlife and their habitats. And here are just a few of their amazing stories in this episode of Saving a Species, Animals in Peril. Sea turtles have been swimming in the oceans for more than 245 million years. One of only four reptiles that live in saltwater, sea turtles used to number in the millions. But today, they're in trouble and face an uncertain future. But first, what do you know about sea turtles? Not much? Well, you're not alone. Even scientists don't know that much about them. And that's because sea turtles spend about 98% of their lives in the water where we can't see what they're doing. As soon as sea turtles hatch, they scramble to the water and disappear. Under normal circumstances, no one will see them again until many years later. And then, it's only the females when they return to the beach to nest. The only other time we see them is when they come ashore injured, ill, or accidentally caught in fishing gear. In fact, although scientists have studied nesting females for many years, most of what we know about sea turtles comes from caring for those that have been rescued. Statistically, fewer than one out of a thousand sea turtle eggs laid actually make it to adulthood, where they are then susceptible to a number of illnesses and injuries. These can be caused by red tides and ocean disturbances, predators, pollution, fishing gear, and other hazards. But. If they're lucky enough to reach shore, the turtles have a chance of being rescued and cared for by highly skilled animal care experts and veterinarians, like those at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. And that brings us to an amazing story of a loggerhead sea turtle that was brought to SeaWorld after being found in distress at the Port St. Lucie power plant in February of 2005. Because of his appearance, they called him Grandpa, and the name stuck. He looks pretty healthy now, but not that long ago, there wasn't a lot of hope for his survival. When Grandpa was brought to SeaWorld, he was missing his entire lower mandible, or jaw, likely the victim of a run-in with a human. That meant he was unable to eat which would have meant certain death out in the wild. Aquarist Jenny Albert was on duty when the turtle arrived. He looked like kind of the typical sub-adult loggerhead that was very malnourished, quite a few bit of barnacles on top, and all of a sudden he lifted his head to breathe and we noticed he's missing his entire lower jaw. From that point on, we knew that he was one of our most special turtles that we would have to rehabilitate. Immediately the wheels were turning with everybody on how to fit this turtle's needs into our daily routine. Grandpa's injuries were a first for the experienced rehabilitation team at SeaWorld. This group has worked with injured and ill sea turtles for more than 25 years. A lot of the injuries we see here are, are boat related, uh, boat hits, fishing hook ingestion, a lot of times foreign object ingestion. This turtle presented with the same symptoms of being malnourished, 
but he wanted to eat. He was starving. He was ravenous when he got here. He wanted to eat, but couldn't. Dr. Mike Walsh was the lead veterinarian for Grandpa's Medical Care. In the time that I've been dealing with sea turtles over the last two decades, I've never seen an injury quite like this. To actually lose the ability to feed yourself is different from anything else we've dealt with. The first order of business was getting food into the malnourished reptile, and that was easier said than done. He rejected everything we tried. He fought us tooth and nail during the tube feedings. They're strong animals to begin with, so it took quite a few staff members to, to hold him down in a safe way that we can access his mouth and his throat. So it was quite challenging for us. But once the turtle realized that he was actually getting food, he quit fighting, and Jenny and her team were able to start working to feed the turtle by hand. But what Jenny had to do was take enough time to gain his trust and say, this is how you're going to get your food. I can put it in a position where you can grab it and actually suck it down. And eventually, the hope was that he would be able to get it off the bottom on his own. Although Grandpa will never be able to be released into the wild again, his rehabilitation is almost complete. He's doing wonderful. When he was able to eat the food off the bottom for the first time in here, I think everybody heard me, and I was so excited that he could do that. But he can eat by himself now and catch fish through the midwater column and off the ground, so he's doing great. That, to me, was tremendous. We actually were able to take an animal that had no chance of survival in the wild and give him another plus in life. What an amazing story of survival. But it sure would be better to prevent this type of injury from happening again. And that's the goal of a World Wildlife Fund project supported by the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund. Every year, hundreds of thousands of sea turtles are accidentally caught by commercial fishermen. A key challenge in the conservation of these animals is their wide-ranging and highly migratory nature. This poses an international challenge requiring an international response. Some scientists warn that these giant turtles could face extinction in the next few decades unless dramatic conservation action occurs. But World Wildlife Fund is working to change that. Kim Davis is the fund's Deputy Director of Fisheries Programs. Scientists estimate that more than 250,000 sea turtles, just leatherbacks and loggerheads, just those two species alone, are caught each year as fisheries bycatch. And many of these turtles are taken in the course of long line fishing, fishing with long horizontal lines, small vertical lines off of them, and hooks at the bottom. The hooks that are normally used for long line fishing, or that are often used, are shaped like J's. Many sea turtles are snagged and caught on these J-shaped hooks. It turns out that if we use hooks that are shaped like circles instead, many fewer sea turtles will be caught. It's a simple, powerful change. The SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund ha has made this possible. They have helped us send people to the ports, to fishing villages, to spend time talking with fishermen about how we can work together. So the fishermen understand that we're looking for solutions that work for them, that work for the turtles, that work for all of us. Now that's conservation at work. But conservation depends on all of us doing what we can to help. So what can you do to help sea turtles survive? Actually, there are a number of things, from supporting organizations that protect sea turtles and their habitats, to reducing the trash that makes its way to the ocean. Plastic bags are often mistaken for jellyfish, a favorite prey animal of some sea turtles. And once ingested, an everyday plastic bag like this can prove fatal. You can help protect sea turtles and other ocean animals by picking up trash. Sometimes it can be that simple. Effective conservation is a big job, but preserving turtles and their habitat is worth the work. Other threats to the survival of sea turtles are the increasing scarcity of safe nesting beaches, as well as the widespread poaching of turtle eggs. In 2004, a remote beach in Costa Rica, Playa Junquial, experienced an egg poaching rate of 100%. It was a critical nesting site for endangered leatherback sea turtles, and this beach captured the attention of scientists and conservationists seeking its protection. 
Historically, local teenagers would poach the eggs as income for their families. The SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund supported a conservation education program targeting these teenagers and their families, encouraging alternative income generated from ecotourism. As a result of this program, the poaching rate at Playa Junquial was reduced to 0% in 2005. Not a single egg was poached. Today, these one-time poachers are now naturalists and interpreters, sharing the story of this incredible species with visiting tourists and the greater Costa Rican community. All over the world, people are working to save species and habitats. From grassroots groups to large conservation organizations, dedicated people are committed to understanding and preserving the biodiversity of our planet. Without this type of support, many of these projects would disappear, and with them, the animals and environments they are working to protect. That's why the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund provides so much needed support to such a diverse group of projects, both here in the U.S. and around the world. Partnerships with other organizations keep conservation work alive, and many times those partners are zoos that are at the forefront of saving species. And it was their work to save rhinos that brought Bush Gardens Tampa Bay together with the World Wildlife Fund and International Rhino Foundation. Rhinoceroses are one of the most endangered species in the world today. For millions of years, they were abundant. But just since 1970, the world's population of rhinos has declined by 90%, making all five remaining species in danger of extinction. World Wildlife Fund's chief scientist, Eric Dinnerstein, has studied rhinos for decades. Rhinos weren't always rare. In fact, rhinos are an example of probably one of the most successful groups of mammals that ever lived on the planet. But what we have today is just a depauperate group that's left. We have five species, two in Africa and three in Asia. The zoological staff at Bush Gardens Tampa Bay has cared for black rhinos for more than 35 years. During that time, they have added significantly to our understanding of the rhino's dietary needs, social behavior, and reproductive physiology. And their success in breeding has been proven by the eight healthy black rhino calves born at the park. Most people aren't aware that more than 80% of all mammals in zoos have been bred and born in zoos in carefully managed programs that protect genetic diversity and the health of the animals. Occasionally, though, animals are brought to zoological facilities from the wild for a variety of conservation reasons. Sometimes animals are moved to avoid overcrowding in the limited wild habitat remaining or sometimes they are moved to establish healthy conservation populations in other parts of the world. These types of measures have helped save some entire species. As successful as Bush Gardens has been breeding black rhinos, there was a little bit of a glitch with breeding the white rhinos. The problem? Two males and no females. So zoo officials turned to the International Rhino Foundation for help. The foundation coordinates the placements of white rhinos all over the world, including animals that can be moved from the wild. After a stringent review, the foundation matched Bush Gardens with Kruger National Park in South Africa. Kruger 
National Park has an extraordinary white rhino conservation program. In fact, it's been so successful that they're able to relocate a number of white rhinos each year for conservation purposes. And three were identified for relocation to Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay. So lead keeper Jason Green and veterinarian Dr. Mike Burton headed off to Africa to be introduced to the rhinos and to escort them back to their new home. Welcome in South Africa. I suppose it's your first trip down there. Yeah. I think the main thing you're here for is the rhinos. Let's yeah. go and have a look at them. Excellent. Do you like it? As soon as we arrive at Kruger, we go to meet Johan Milan and see the rhinos we'll be taking back. Johan is one of the vet techs that works on the capture team, and it's his job to care for the rhinos, make sure they're healthy and prepared for the move. The rhinos that are brought here are chosen after a lengthy process. First, park rangers determine if any rhino group is too densely populated. If it is, then they determine which of those rhinos need to be moved. The next step is to decide whether it will be a translocation to another wildlife area or a relocation to a zoological facility. If it's a relocation, then the animals come here to be prepared for the transport. Over a period of months, the rhinos are moved along through a series of enclosures called bomas, where they are gradually acclimated to unfamiliar noises, vehicle traffic, and contact with humans. Animal health and safety is a number one priority here, and everything is done to ensure that the animals are adapting well to the changes. And if they don't seem to be adapting, you just turn we back just, home? We just take them straight away to where we've captured them, so they know the area, they know where's the water, and everything. The last step in the acclimation process is to move shipping crates into the enclosures with the animals. From this point on, the rhinos are fed in the crates, which makes them become just another non-threatening part of the rhino's environment. Our last day at Kruger starts early because there are several other rhinos to be loaded for transport in addition to our three. By 6 a.m., people are hustling everywhere, and soon everything is underway. After months of work to prepare the rhinos for the trip, the loading process moves really smoothly. Since there is a lot of activity and extra people associated with the move, each rhino is darted with a mild sedative that relaxes it and keeps it calm. Next, Johan and his crew lure the rhino into the crate with a rice bag on a stick. And after the rhino is in the crate, the crew puts in the rear bars of the crate to secure the animal inside. Last, the outer doors of the crate go on, and it's lifted by a crane and set onto the flatbed semi that will transport the rhinos to the airport. I'm really impressed at how quickly and efficiently the rhinos are loaded. By 10 o'clock, we're ready to head for the airport at Johannesburg, and before long, these guys will be in their new home. I'm really proud to be part of a conservation effort that's making such a difference for an endangered species. I really feel like I'm part of something that's going to last for a long time, kind of a legacy for the rhinos. What an experience that trip was. But the best part of all is how well they've done since they've been here at Bush Gardens. They live on our huge Serengeti Plain with our two other rhinos, and since then, we've even had two calves. I really feel we're making a difference. Zoos offer many resources for preserving species, and our ability to collect data on the animals in our care can help those who care for and maintain wild populations too. We firmly believe that knowledge is the key to conservation success, because the more we know about these guys, the smarter we can work for them. Here's another simple solution to a potential life-threatening situation. The Florida manatee is one of the most endangered marine mammals in the United States, and entanglement is a small but significant cause of injury and death to these gentle mammals. Senior biologist Dr. Ann Bowles of Hub SeaWorld Research Institute may have found a solution. Manatees are specialized for the sense of touch, so in order for them to understand what something is, they have to touch it, go up to it. They become entangled when they find something unusual in their environment, the crab pot plus the line plus the float on the surface, and they begin to manipulate it as they explore it. It becomes wrapped around their pectoral flippers or their body and tightens so they can't get out. Preventing these entanglements became a priority for Dr. Bowles and the Hubs SeaWorld Research Institute. We need to find something that the fishermen would be able to use. So what we are now working with is called calf rope. It's used in rodeos 
but it's made out of stiff nylon and it's designed to hold a struggling animal without tightening on it. What we've done is to create a line that is safe for them to manipulate. They can touch it as much as they want. Even if it circles around them, they'll be able to slide right out of it. So we've made it safe. Drought, flooding, hurricanes, fires, diseases, these are all natural events that we can't control. But even though we can't prevent these things from happening, we know we can make a difference in the course of what happens afterwards, at least in the lives of animals that are injured, ill, or displaced from their homes. Hurricanes are powerful storms that wreak havoc in their paths, often destroying homes, businesses, and lives. These storms also destroy animal habitats and occasionally aquariums or zoos in the path of the storm, leaving animals stranded and sometimes injured. And that's when zoos and aquariums can come to the rescue. From doing things like sending veterinarians and supplies to the affected areas, to rescuing displaced or injured animals and providing temporary housing, help takes many forms. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist Nicole Adame knows the agency can always rely on SeaWorld and Bush Gardens for help. We work with SeaWorld as a partner in our rehabilitation program and our rescue program and we would call them when there's an injured or distressed animal and they would go out and assess the situation, determine the best course of action for that animal. So we rely on them to be our eyes and our ears out in the field and to make the best judgment the best decision for those animals. Disasters notwithstanding, more often it's a subtle natural event that causes a perplexing problem, as was the case for these endangered brown pelicans. The Salton Sea in Southern California is an important stop for migratory birds on the Pacific Flyway. With only 5% of wetlands remaining in the area, more than 400 species of birds come to the sea and its marshes. However, since 1976, some of the endangered brown pelicans that stop here have contracted avian botulism, a debilitating disease that causes muscle paralysis and without treatment, certain death. Scientists believe the birds get the botulism from tilapia, one of the fish in the Salton Sea. SeaWorld San Diego is one of several rescue facilities for the sick pelicans. And over the years, a medical protocol has been established for this problem so veterinarians and aviculturists can quickly begin treatment. The disease botulism causes muscle paralysis. Um, not every bird has the same problems. Some are so severely affected, they can't hold their head up. They can't blink. They can't even move their wings. What's critical in therapy for botulism is to act very quickly. Rehabilitation usually takes several weeks, but soon the pelicans are healthy enough to go back to the wild. Okay, let's do it. Let him go. Every year, SeaWorld treats an average of 75 endangered brown pelicans that have fallen ill at the Salton Sea. And we'll be ready to help next year, and the year after that, and every year the birds need our help. Unfortunately, natural events will continue to adversely affect wildlife. But with enough people willing to work to repair the damage, Injured, ill, or stranded animals will continue to have hope after the disaster strikes. You may be wondering how a simple tool like a computer can actually help save wildlife. Well, a group of students from both the U.S. and Africa definitely showed us how. The bushmeat trade in Africa kills thousands of forest animals every year. To increase awareness of this wildlife crisis, Cameroon's Limbe Wildlife Center used the internet to link students there with students at Bush Gardens Adventure Camp. Through this cyberspace connection, Patrick Waitman and other students learn how worldwide conservation can help. Killing populations of endangered animals just so that they can survive because they need to 
provide for them their, themselves not thinking about the big picture and uh, it's education that can help fix that. And can communication, education, and conservation really make a difference? It can. Uh, if there's enough involvement, enough enthusiasm from people willing to help, um, and they're willing to participate, um, we can maybe help figure out ways to cut back on bush meat. Just a little bit of ingenuity, a little help from outside sources, just to show them different ways of obtaining food. Over the past 30 years, SeaWorld and Bush Gardens have rescued more than 14,000 animals, from ill or injured manatees like these guys to a stranded infant gray whale. Every new challenge we face brings opportunities for new research and new knowledge that oftentimes makes the next rescue and rehabilitation easier. One of our partners in our quest for knowledge is the Hub SeaWorld Research Institute an internationally renowned facility dedicated to learning about and preserving the world's oceans. Hub SeaWorld Research Institute has spent decades devoted to research and scientific discovery about the ocean and its inhabitants. Researchers employ many techniques to learn more, but much of their research on animals has been conducted on marine species during their rehabilitation after rescue. And while the information collected has been valuable in understanding more about every species studied, little is known about how, or even if, the time spent in rehabilitative care affects the animals once they are returned to the wild. And that's just what Dr. Brent Stewart, senior research biologist at the Institute, hopes to change with satellite tracking. The tracking information is really important because it gives us information about what the animals do naturally after their um, reacquainted with the marine environment. The first step is how well they do once they're released. Um, do they survive? Uh, how long do they survive? And then where do they go? And how well do they uh, integrate back into the, the environment that they um, had been living in? The insights gained by tracking animals after release may help improve techniques, both in rescue and rehabilitation, so that every animal has an even better chance of survival. It's encouraging the animals seem to be able to re-enter the marine environment and do what they should be doing to survive. From rescue and rehabilitation, to breeding of endangered species, to studying species and habitat, we're committed to making the world a better, safer place for all wildlife. But we can save species, and we can save habitat, and we can make a difference. One animal, one habitat, one day at a time. Whether we're helping wild animals or dogs like Nikki and Nellie, it's certainly worth it. For the future, for the animals, and for the planet. On behalf of SeaWorld and Bush Gardens, thanks for watching this episode of Saving a Species. I'm Jenny Bush, Conservation Ambassador for the Anheuser-Busch Adventure Parks. SeaWorld, Bush Gardens, and Discovery Cove are dedicated to the conservation and preservation of wildlife. And we believe the stories like the one you just experienced need to be told. The animals featured in this program are just a few of the many species that benefit from the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, a nonprofit charitable organization dedicated to habitat protection wildlife research, animal rescue, and conservation education. Your support for the continued viewing of programs like this is appreciated. I encourage you to learn all you can about animals and their environment. Remember, we're all interconnected. What happens to them eventually happens to us. So we need to protect them and their habitats. Together, we can make a difference.